from sunny St. Leonard's on the south coast of the UK, this is the Keto Woman Podcast. Brought to you by me, Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies, and welcome to episode number 198. Today is the first of one of the new format shows. This time we're talking about nutrition and I've called them bite-sized nutrition. This one is with Megan Pfeffer, who you may remember from episode number 143, where she talked about her own story and her work, where she specializes on helping women with lipedema and treating them with, of course, a ketogenic diet. Today, though, she's here to talk to us about vitamin D. Now, I thought I knew quite a lot about vitamin D, but there's an awful lot I didn't know and that I found really, really interesting. I've always known how important vitamin D is to just about every part of our bodies. It impacts every system and is crucial to our health and well-being. But there are some really interesting things that it impacts that are particularly relevant to us. So I think you're going to find this just as fascinating as I did. Now, we do talk about getting your own blood test done if you can't get your health practitioner, GP, to order them for you. Because I don't know about where you are, but here in the UK, it's not always too easy. Actually, they did happen to order vitamin D as part of a panel of other things that I was getting. If you remember a few episodes back, I was complaining about the lack of adequate thyroid testing and a company that I found that does do full thyroid panels. And I went to have a look and they do vitamin D as well. I think I'll probably do an episode telling you more about them and maybe talking about some of the tests it's useful to get. But in the meantime, you can find them at monitormyhealth.org.uk and the website address probably gives you a bit of a clue that it's a non-profit venture and is indeed run by the NHS. The pricing is pretty good. It's the lowest I've found. And this is one of the things that's very important to them. They wanted to be able to offer these tests at an affordable price. There's quite a limited range, but a good one nonetheless. You can get a thyroid panel, vitamin D, as I mentioned, a cholesterol panel and HbA1c. Or you can get the even better priced full screen, which gives you the whole lot. I've also included in the show notes links given to me by Megan for testing in Australia and also in the States. And she likes to recommend the one that's run by Siobhan Huggins and Dave Feldman, as all the proceeds go towards their Citizen Science Foundation, which, as she says, and I agree with, is pretty cool. There is a link in the show notes, but you can find them at ownyourlabs.com. So what's been happening in my life over this last week? Well, my focus is still very much on Rocket. I would say in general that his anxiety is getting a little bit better, but he's still struggling a lot. Following the advice from Brian, I did get him a thunder shirt and I managed to snap a picture of him the other day in the park. So I'll share that with you on social media. He, of course, looks very smart and very handsome and likes to be told by everybody just how handsome he is. I was also tagged by somebody who works with Iranda, last week's guest, and she mentioned somebody she knows who is a dog trainer, behaviorist, psychologist. I'm not sure exactly how she would describe herself. Her name's Janine and she's fascinating. I'm actually trying to persuade her to come on the podcast because she has a very interesting story and she's a member of the keto community too. She is though, like so many of my potential guests, a bit shy. So I'm leaving the ball in her court, but I would very much like to hear her story and I'm pretty sure you would too. And who doesn't want to hear more about dogs, dog psychology and dog training? Well, I mean, maybe if you're not as into dogs as I am, but I'm pretty sure most of you are. Anyway, she's fantastic and particularly fantastic for me because her speciality is Spanish hunting dogs. So she knows Potenko's inside and out. 
and was able to give me some really fantastic breed-specific advice. Because as she says, they are very sensitive souls and do need to be handled a little bit differently from other breeds. She laughed when I told her that I naively thought, well, you know, they're just a Spanish lurcher. How different can they be? And in many ways they aren't. But in a lot of ways they are very different. And they do need some special handling. Chatting with her revealed just how much I've got to learn. But she has promised to help me do that. First and foremost, we've got to help Rocket with his current state of anxiety. And she explained to me about the emotional bucket. And in some ways, very similar to Brian's traffic light system or his colors of the mind. And it reminds me also of Elena's migraine bucket. It's the same kind of thing. You just imagine your dog carrying around a bucket and every time something stresses them out is a bit overwhelming emotionally. Their bucket keeps getting filled up with more and more water and they're carrying it around with them. And apparently the only way they can empty that is to sleep for 16 hours. So if they're not getting adequate sleep or really poor quality sleep, then they're starting that next day without having being able to fully empty that emotional bucket. So it's going to be even easier for it to overflow. So the first thing we've got to do is to help Rocket empty that emotional bucket every day. And she's recommended some herbal tablets that should really help with this. They're due to arrive tomorrow and he's going to be on a loading dose for a week and then carry on for potentially, by the sounds of it, about six months. She also advised working a lot more with treats and that's something I haven't done that much of, to be honest. So today I went out and bought some chicken livers and they've just been cooking and drying out a bit in the oven. I bought some dehydrated turkey liver treats, which the other two absolutely adore, but he's not that bowled over by. And as it turns out, this is a really good way actually of telling how stressed he is because he just won't want a treat, however delicious it might be. So it's a really good gauge for me if I'm not completely sure how anxious he is, to find what his most favorite treat is and offer it to him. And if he won't take it, then that's a good indication. He's feeling too stressed out and his emotional bucket is overflowing. So it's all quite complicated, but very logical, really. And like I say, it's revealing to me just how much I don't know and how much I'm not doing to really optimize the well-being of my dog's She's recommended all sorts of different things to help stimulate and tire them out through different ideas for play and games. So I'm going to start implementing some of those. I've already been playing around with Amy and training her to do a few things. I dug out a clicker that I was given years and years ago with my first dog, actually, I had real problems with her with fear and aggression and I went to see a dog behaviorist and she gave me a book on clicker training and a clicker and I have to confess that I'm not very good at consistency with things like that so it just kind of ended up being put on the shelf but I dug out that clicker because Amy is really really driven by treats. She loves treats and she really likes these dehydrated ones which are super easy to carry around. So I've just been playing around with getting her to do a few things for treats. And I thought I might as well start that association with the clicker at the same time. Having not been a dog who sits, it's always been a bit embarrassing in the park if other people are asking if they can give her a treat and they ask her to sit like their dogs do. And it's like, oh, no, actually, she doesn't do that. Well, now she does. She learned how to do it in just 10 minutes or so. Not so easy getting her to do it in the park yet, but there are lots of distractions. And give her time. She only learned how to do it yesterday evening. But she's a very quick learner and it does help when they're driven by treats. The only thing is, of course, she doesn't want to leave anybody's side in the park who might have treats. But maybe that's something else we're going to have to try and learn how to do, probably with treats. I shall ask Janine. As is very fitting with an episode about vitamin D, we have seen more of the sunshine this week in the UK, at least where I am on the south coast. 
And apparently we're going to get a bit of that heat wave that's affecting Southern Europe at the moment. I hope not too much. I like the sunshine, but I don't like it when it gets too hot. Anyway, that's my news for the week. I hope wherever you are, you've had a good week and are heading into a fantastic weekend. Until next week, please take very good care and I'll see you then. Welcome back to the Keto Woman podcast, Megan. How are you doing today? Hi, Daisy. I'm really well, thank you. It's so nice to be here with you. And we're almost on opposite sides of the globe. So morning for me, evening for you. Yes. <laughs> it's one of those time zone differences that stretches it a little bit. It's all right when there's just two of us. I know when I've recorded with Louise and, and some of my other keto buddies, when we've had a mass get together, it gets really complicated. <laughs> and somebody, usually poor old Louise, has to record really, really late at night. <laughs> it's the problem, isn't it? When you're yes, exactly. on the extreme ends of time zones. <laughs> yes. And it's who's going to take the early shift, who's going to do the late shift. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me today. Now, this is one of the new format episodes where I speak to nutritionists about something that they think is really important to uh, ketogenic or low carb lifestyle. Maybe something we've overlooked, maybe something we all need to be finding to eat in our diet, supplementing with, testing. Who knows? But that's why I thought I would love to start one of these new format episodes with you. Spoken to you before, fascinating episodes. So over to you, Megan. What are you going to share with us today? All right. Well, I've decided today to talk about vitamin D. It's something that's super important to a lot of people. And even you know when you're changing your diet and getting a good diet, it's something that we don't really get enough of through our diet. You can get vitamin D through the diet and certain foods, but you also need to be out in the sunshine to get good vitamin D. And some people aren't doing that at all. And particularly, you know, we're talking about overweight women nowadays where people, of course, you know, with lockdowns and things like that, everyone's indoors a lot. So there's that side of it as well. And also, you know, women with lipedema and lipolympedema and obesity and those sorts of conditions are affected even more so by vitamin D, low levels of vitamin D, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I thought this was a really good one to start off with because it seems really obvious to a lot of people who, are, who have been supplementing with vitamin D for a long time, but there's a surprisingly high number of women who don't supplement with vitamin D have never had it tested. Mm. They have no idea of what their levels are. It's not a test that generally doctors want to test or even you know, suggest to test. And, and quite often, if you ask them to test it, still don't want to test it. <laughs> it's one that I think that if your doctor doesn't want to test it, it's actually good to do of your own accord um, through different lab companies to just to get an idea of where your levels are. Uh, but you're generally going to be low if you're never outside because it's the sun on the skin that actually activates the synthesis of vitamin D. The sun doesn't actually provide the vitamin D, but it activates for that vitamin D, D production. So if you have low levels or not getting out in, into the sun, uh, obviously that's going to be lower. If you use blockout a lot in the sun, then your levels are going to be lower and of course, even, you know, women over the age of 50 have decreased levels. And also, you know, if you have darker skin or Asian ethnicity, you're going to have lower levels as well. But particularly women with obesity, lipedema and lymphedema are going to have reduced levels. And interestingly, even women with breast cancer are regularly found to have low levels of vitamin D as well. So it's a real issue. Um, I find it really prevalent in my um, clinical practice that women have low levels. So it's one that's, I think, worth addressing. It's a good place to start. It's generally somewhere that I will start with women to see what their vitamin D levels are, um, particularly because it's so important in this um, environment that we're in at the moment. It, it is really important for the immune system. Mm. Studies are showing that um, there are better outcomes with you know current health conditions that are that are going on with viruses and things like that that it can actually help the degree or the severity of, of what's going on yes absolutely and I don't know why it's not spoken about more 
I don't know if you ever followed John Campbell. I followed him a lot in the early days of COVID. And he started talking about his suspicions about vitamin D quite early on. I think what led him to start thinking about it were the differences um, between the black communities and white communities. It seemed to be a stark difference. And it's, I think that's what triggered him into thinking, oh, I wonder about vitamin D. And he was talking about it quite a lot. And then eventually there was a study done, wasn't there? And it showed that there was indeed a difference. And it was splashed all over the news for a while. And then it just vanished. (laughs) Why? Why is it not still up there? Because it is something that's so important. And it's it's interesting, vitamin D, because of course, it's, it's not a vitamin, is it? It's a hormone. Yes, that's right. Yes, it's a steroid hormone. So why is it so important? And What are the potential issues that we're going to come across? You mentioned the immune system there. What are the potential issues we're going to come across if we are towards the low end of the scale or even worse, deficient in vitamin D? Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of different, I mean, there are lots of different symptoms of vitamin D deficiency and conditions that can be associated with vitamin D deficiency. And they will include things like muscle weakness, depression, and we'll Mm -hmm. talk about that more in a moment, bone pain, fatigue, uh, heart disease and high blood pressure. Vitamin D has a vasoprotective effect, diabetes and glucose uh, dysregulation. Infections and immune system disorders, so, you know, increased susceptibility to infections, falls in older people, things like multiple sclerosis and autoimmune conditions, uh, some types of cancers like prostate cancer, colon cancer and breast cancer and obesity because the fat cells in obesity keep vitamin D isolated so it isn't released. And so you often need to take larger levels to maintain normal blood levels. So that's you know, really something important to know, I mm. think, for anyone who does have excess weight and is in that obesity category, that you're going to have a different requirement for vitamin D. So it becomes really important to have the testing done and also to, to monitor that, I think, along the way, particularly for people who are losing weight, because if you think about it being stored in the fat cells and you're releasing weight, it's going to have a, a different approach. So if you're taking really high levels of vitamin D and you're releasing vitamin D from your fat cells, uh, you want to ensure that you're not sort of running into toxicity levels, which can occur. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Is it one of those supplements that you can take where you can actually take too much? It is, yes, because it's stored in fat cells. But as I was saying, it levels in the bloodstream can be too high. And so they've shown even um, there are some studies that you know show associations, not correlations, but between vitamin D, really low levels of vitamin D, and so in the deficiency levels, but also in really high levels right. of vitamin D, mm-hmm. cardiovascular risk factors and increased mortality from uh, with people who have either really high or really low. So you want to be sort of somewhere in the middle range. You don't want to be down at that bottom end, certainly. You want to be higher up in the range, but you don't want to be too high. And I think this is sort of important to know because there's a lot of practitioners out there that just want vitamin D to be super high. Mm. But I think there's really a lot more area of research that needs to be done before, certainly before I would feel confident wanting levels to be super high, I think you're better off staying in a in a range. So if you can get sort of slap bang in the middle, and I know I've read in some thyroid groups that they like you to be in that middle to sort of upper middle, but not getting into the middle to high range, but, you know, really solidly middle or a bit above is where they like you to be. I think so. And when you're talking about the NMOL per litre, then we're looking at, I think, really sort of 80 to 100. Anything over 100 is starting to get on the high side. I know some practitioners like it to be around 125, particularly if you have autoimmune conditions. But I think, you know, from what I've seen um, so far that I like to stick between the 80 to the 80 to 100 type range. I'll find a conversion table and put it in because I know we all sort of deal with different ranges. So 100 in the NG's ML is about 40. 
Right. Yes. That's where I have in my head that I like to be about 40, 50, somewhere like that. Yes. And that's where I like to be. Yes. So that's obviously my range. Yeah. And when is the best time to test? Because obviously at, at different, depends where you live in the world, but you know, where I live in the UK, I would expect my levels to be highest heading into the winter, for example. Yes. And so finding out if I needed to supplement, maybe the time if I'm doing it for the first time might be coming out of the winter. I don't know. When is the best time or maybe both? When's the best time to test? Well, I think, well, I mean, really any time that you're able to and you can take into account the time of year that you do that. So obviously your levels are generally going to be lower in winter, but if you're supplementing during that time or if you're relying on the sun to provide your vitamin D and maybe some foods, then you can be going outside and getting that over the summer times but obviously uh, during winter and usually through depending on where you are in the world that the times outside of that summer period can be very difficult to get enough even if the sun is out that you're not able to get the the right types of rays that can start that conversion process Mm. so you really you know I think need to be supplementing other times of the year if particularly if your levels aren't high to begin with and so many people, you know, do have low levels because they're not getting outside and exposing their skin to the sun, or as we were saying before, because they have obesity um, or high weight issues and lipedema and and those sorts of things. So they're, they're actually not um, they're, they're storing the vitamin D and not releasing it. So they've got those lower levels available. And is there a level that you would recommend that an average person like me who seems to, I've just had mine tested and it was in that, um, it was in that good, solid mid range level. But would you say, cause I've been thinking about supplementing over the winter, would you say there's a sort of a level of dose that would be a good idea for somebody like me, who's not going to get enough sunshine over the winter to think about supplementing for um, a few months over the winter, you know, 4,000 IU or something like that. I don't know. Is there a sort of an average dose that would be a, a good idea for someone at those average kind of levels to look at without necessarily needing to keep testing all the time? Yeah, well, well, I would say just as a maintenance type dose if your levels are quite okay that you know one or two thousand international units would be more than enough really just to keep that level up for some people perhaps with autoimmune conditions might want to make that a little higher uh, you really don't want to be going over 4,000 international units. Some people are taking, you know, really high levels, 5,000 or 10,000 international units. I, I just think that's that's much too high uh, to be taking. There's potentially um, circumstances that that would, if you're super low, if you're really in that severe deficiency range, obviously that's going to be different. But as a general upkeep, you know, one or 2,000 international units, I have heard people say, look, 4,000 international units nowadays in the environment that we're in to keep levels nice and high Mm. so somewhere between two and four thousand international units I think would be a good range but to get tested I think we're very similar with our feelings about supplements and we're not overly keen really on taking too many or you know advising other people to think about taking too many but there are some yes that maybe everyone can benefit from but rather to test first to see if you need it before taking it yeah absolutely but you know certainly though with with vitamin d i mean if you're not able to get the test and you're not going out into the sun Mm. and you're not specifically having cod liver oil or you know things that are high in vitamin d and you're you know you're and you're carrying a lot of extra weight chances are you are going to be low. So taking some vitamin D supplements, if you don't have the opportunity to get that testing is pretty much a no brainer in that scenario. Right. But if you are getting outside a lot and, and, and that type of thing, then, you know, yes, you, you do want to get it tested before you start taking it. Taking vitamin D is better in the earlier part of the day. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah, vitamin D and melatonin can interfere with melatonin production. Ah, interesting. So taking it at the night time could potentially, you know, cause disruption, sleep disruption. So if you're not a good sleeper in particular, I think it's yeah, something to, but for everyone really, taking it in the earlier part of the day and taking it with a meal can also be yes. a, um, a, a good way because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. So you want to take it with fats. They're generally made with fats 
fats, which is another thing that um, that I like to check what excipients they're made with, which means what they're actually mixed with. So when you're taking a vitamin D supplement, it's usually not just the vitamin D. They're quite often in a gel or you know with some oil to help that. So you want to make sure that it's not with the vegetable oils, which they're often mixed with with the cheaper supplements. Right. I know I was taking a dry form actually. I don't. I don't think I have problems absorbing vitamin D, but I do have problems absorbing vitamin A when they're in these um, oil capsules, or I even had it injected. Um, I won't go down that tangent, but I got very deficient and I kept getting more deficient despite taking extremely high doses and even being injected with it suspended in oil. And I only managed to get my levels up when I started taking the dry form, Mm. which I've never completely figured out why that was. I think we may have even discussed it, maybe something to do with gallbladder, but we won't go that way. But I was taking some dry form vitamin D tablets. So yes, it, it, especially if you're taking a tablet like that, it's really important to take it with some fat in a meal, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yes. We've spoken about the importance of getting outside into the sunshine. It's often known as the sunshine vitamin. I can remember watching a video, I think it was Ivor Cummins, actually, who did a video talking about vitamin D and the need for and the lack of supplementation and some of the problems it can cause. And he was speaking about the importance about when, if you can, when you got that sun, that there were higher levels, I think, of the UVB rays in the morning than in the afternoon where it switched more to the UVA. And he was particularly talking about this in reference to sun cream. And I know a lot of people won't go outside in the sun without first putting quite a high factor sun cream on. And I know that's uh, particularly the case in Australia, but there can be some problems that come with that. And you did mention sun cream earlier, but I know a lot of people are worried about not using sun cream. So how do we find that balance? I'm a bit towards the other end, actually. I rarely use it. I have now got a product, which is a very natural product, um, I don't like the feel of sun creams, the smell of them. I don't. I go in the sea a lot, so I don't like the fact that it dumps all sorts of nasties in the sea. So I've I found a a natural product to use when the sun is particularly strong. I've you know I tan quite easily and I don't tend to burn that easily. So I'm not overly worried. Although I have noticed that it ages me a lot. <laughs> I've got a lot more wrinkles. So from from that side, but I like to get the sun because I think of vitamin D. Yeah. How can you advise people on that? Because I know it's a really difficult subject for a lot of people. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing with sunscreens too, obviously, you know, they're often fragranced and they contain uh, xenoestrogens, which are hormone mimickers. So they can disrupt our, our hormones too. Uh-huh. So, you know, I'm not a fan of using sunscreens. You, you really need to find the right ones. But mind you, if I'm out on the boat all day, and, uh, and if you're out on the beach all day, exactly. then, yeah, you certainly don't want to get burned. Mm. So I would rather yeah, perhaps um, use some sunscreen or, you know, try to cover up with clothing as much as I can. I, I've had breast cancer, so I'm really not keen on using those sorts of things. Mm. So I think you need to judge for your own body of what sort of chemical tolerance you need. But you really only need that sun exposure as far as vitamin D for 15 minutes a day. It's a couple of hours a day if you have really dark skin. The darker your skin, the more exposure that you need. And if you're very prone to burning, and one of the benefits that we know with ketogenic diets, you hear so many people say, I used to burn so much easier, but I don't really burn as much now. Mm. Uh, But some people are very fair skin and burn very quickly. And being out during the, the midday ish kind of you know either side of midday it's not ideal to be out in midday sun can be tricky for people and so if that's the case I think rather than you know putting yourself at that risk of burning and and having the sorts of problems that comes from that I think in those instances you you know perhaps better off to to still get out into some morning sun because we know that regulating your circadian rhythm, getting that early morning sun. I was going to say it's good for other things as well, yes, isn't it? it Just is. getting out there, exposing your eyes and your skin to yes. early morning sun. Yeah, absolutely. So it does have that benefit for, for other reasons and then maybe leave as far as the, the vitamin D aspect goes, then just get a really good quality vitamin D and, and monitor your levels. And I think that's perhaps a better way for some people to navigate that. 
And of course, we can get some vitamin D from our diet. And I think it might even be added to some products. I'm not sure. Yeah, they will be fortified in, in eggs. Sometimes mushrooms can be, depends on how they're grown. They need to be exposed to, to sunlight to, to have them. Um, but it's mostly found in fatty fish you know, things like mackerel and tuna and salmon. So some fortified dairies and eggs has it as well. But really, unless you're having things uh, like the fatty fish and getting sort of those large portions of, of that or the cod liver oil, which is good for having vitamin D and vitamin A, which are, are both really important fat soluble vitamins to get, then you're not really probably going to be getting enough through your through your diet. Mm-hmm. But again, it, that's going to depend on what your your levels are to start with. So if you're relying on food, I think it would be good to to have a look at your levels, assess whether you're getting any outside sun as well. the The daily recommendations are usually about 800 international units, so it's not really a lot. And that's obviously not going to be that's for healthy people, general mm. the general population. So if you you know if you have increased requirements above that, um, like autoimmune conditions and obesity and lipedema, you're going to have higher higher requirements anyway. So you really need to go through and work out what are the high foods and how to incorporate them into your diet on a regular basis. The other thing, of course, is that you also need to consider other nutrients that are important with vitamin D absorption. So you're going to need to look at calcium and um, magnesium because the three of those nutrients really all work synergistically. So you, you really need to make sure that you're getting all three of them so that the, the levels of, of all of them are either absorbed or you know that you're not getting too high levels of calcium. If you're having really high vitamin D levels but not enough calcium or really high calcium levels and not enough vitamin D, you're going to find that calcium is going to get into your into your soft tissues. And so magnesium and vitamin K2, which comes from animal foods. So again, if you're vegetarian. Yes, I was going to, I was going to ask you about K2, because I always think about that with if you're taking vitamin D, then it's good to take K2 and magnesium were the two that I always think of. Uh, I didn't know so much about calcium. I tend to get calcium easily from my diet. um, So I wouldn't think of because I think you have to be a bit wary about supplementing calcium, don't you? You do. And preferably calcium is is one of those things that you should be getting through your diet. Mm. Uh, But some people who can't do dairy, you know, say they've got an autoimmune condition and and it's dairy flares them up or they just have a food intolerance or um, that they can't do the dairy. So that's taking out a lot. And then if they don't like having fatty fish or uh, fish with bones, uh, the soft bones in them, you're taking out some pretty big areas of calcium and you're going to sort of I think find it hard to make up for that particularly when you, you're doing keto and having to, to carb count that you're a little more restricted mm. for women who for me if they aren't doing dairy and if they're not interested in doing salmon tin salmon that has the soft bones or the mackerel or, or sardines and, and anchovies and all of those things that can provide good sources of calcium uh, then sometimes calcium supplementation is needed because calcium is so important. But if you're going to supplement it, then you really want to make sure that you're getting good magnesium levels and good K2 levels because that's what's going to help direct it, um, stop the calcium from going into your soft tissues, which is your heart and you know your arteries and, and those sorts of things. You want it to be going to your bones and your teeth and the, mm. the plate, that extracellular matrix in your bones, which is where the, the calcium should be. And uh, yeah, so you really need to make sure you are getting those other nutrients if you're going to supplement. Uh, I mean, you need those other nutrients anyway, but especially more so if you're going to take an isolated supplement with something like calcium, because it can lead to calcifications uh, in the arteries. And so that, um, you know, sort of atherosclerosis picture and mm-hmm. is um, yeah, important to look out for. And does it matter? Because Magnesium, we should do an episode on magnesium. Magnesium is one of those supplements that I think a lot of people in the keto low carb community do take. But uh, more often, I think I certainly do anyway, take it at night because it can help with sleep. Is it going to matter 
if you're taking your vitamin D in the morning and your magnesium at night, is it all going to mix up in your system or is it important to take them together? I have noticed actually that you can get vitamin D tablets that are a combined tablet that already have K2 and magnesium in them, I think. Yeah. I usually quite like to separate magnesium dosing. So there's some in the morning. Yes. I was wondering about doing that. Mm. Yeah. Because if people are having you know really stressful days and you use magnesium for so many things, and I just think, you know, with the half-life of things, I, I think it's good to kind of spread it out. So to have some mm. some in the morning and to, to take some before bed. I, I think if you're having really disrupted sleep and a lot of anxiety and things where um, it's going to benefit the sleep more that you could put it there and wait until things improve and then maybe separate it out during the day. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, I'm, I had thought about maybe doing that. I take two tablets, so it would be very easy to do that. Well, that's been really interesting. I'm racking my brains to think if we've missed anything about vitamin D. Is there anything else on your list that we haven't spoken about? Well, there's just some some other things like you know, we've talked about the um, accumulation of vitamin D in obesity. Vitamin D does have another role in fat metabolism because it's important with calcium is actually important with fat metabolism as well because the vitamin D status is closely related to the calcium status in weight loss. Vitamin D makes the fat cells more metabolically active mm. by increasing the release of calcium that's stored in the fat. Interesting. So calcium increases fat oxidation and fat burning. Mm. So I think that's really important to know <laughs> for women that are looking to lose weight <laughs> yeah. that, you know, maybe you know, vitamin D and calcium is such an important factor. And often when vitamin D is low, calcium is low. A couple of other things that I wanted to mention, one of them is that vitamin D does have another role in fat metabolism because one of its mechanisms is related to the hormone adiponectin. And uh, that hormone is exclusively secreted from adipose tissue, uh, which are, with adipose tissue meaning fat cells. And it's involved in glucose regulation and fatty acid breakdown. And when low levels of adiponectin, which are also low from insulin, so high insulin levels will create low levels of adiponectin. Uh. So it's a really important thing to, to get right. It's an independent risk factor for metabolic syndrome and vitamin D may be involved in adiponectin synthesis. So again, when you're looking at trying to fix metabolism mm. and go to fat burning and all of these things, these are other elements that are really important to take into account. So supplementing vitamin D for overweight people can help with the breakdown of fats, which we call, you know, lipolysis. And that's why, you know, we do love keto. Mm. So we talked about it being anti-inflammatory. Low vitamin D can actually lead to lower estrogen levels. They have a, a synergistic relationship. So for people with hormone imbalances, looking at vitamin D is really important as well. Vitamin D regulates nitric oxide synthesis and lower levels are a precursor to atherosclerosis, so that plaque in the arteries that we spoke about before. And um, vitamin D also helps to regulate adrenaline and noradrenaline and dopamine production, and it protects from serotonin depletion. So low levels can increase depression significantly. So I think that's, you know, something for a lot of people um, to take into account who are having mood disorders, that this is something that you might want to explore that could be contributing to that as well. Yes, I just underlined that actually to bring back up. Yeah, I mean, as you know, that's something that's very relevant to me personally. And it's interesting, isn't it? I think sometimes when you look back with hindsight, it's obvious really, but somewhere in your body, you know what to do to make yourself feel better when you're feeling depressed. And for me, the thing that has helped most this year since I've moved to the UK and I bang on about it all the time. So I'm sure everyone knows what I'm going to say. But that swimming in the sea, that involves a 15 minute walk there, a 15 minute walk back. And obviously being in the sea itself and there are the benefits from that. But of course, it's being out in not always sunlight, <laughs> but out in the fresh air and exposed to natural light anyway, but very often the sun as well. And, you know, my family have commented every time they see me, it looks like I've been on holiday because I get browner and browner, but that's just from 
you know, maybe only spending an hour a day just walking to the sea, getting in, coming back. But yes, that activity makes me feel better. And I know part of it is the activity, but I'm sure also part of it is intuition deep in my body saying, get out there, get in the sunshine because you need to boost your vitamin D. Yes. And um, just one of the last things I wanted to mention as well was inflammation because vitamin D can modulate fat cell inflammation. And we know in particular with lipedema and the same with obesity as well, that inflammation is a major factor that needs to be addressed Mm. because when you have that cell hypertrophy, that fat cells enlarging, it sets off an immune uh, system response that leads to this chronic inflammation. And that's one of the reasons why we love a ketogenic diet because the ketone beta hydroxybutyrate really helps to um, to interrupt that inflammasome pathway that leads to inflammation. Vitamin D is also able to to help with that as that. So some sometimes women, you know, are doing keto and they're finding that they're so they've still got levels of inflammation and um, of course having excess weight itself you know, causes the inflammation. But you know sometimes it, it, you can have a look at things like vitamin D to see if that might be another avenue that that you can explore to to try to get those levels of inflammation down. And of course, just lastly to to finish off looking at medications, you know, can lower vitamin D. So things like um, laxatives or, you know, if you're having food intolerances that are leading to a faster bowel transit time, Mm. um, steroids that some people are are taking like um, prednisone, Uh, if you're taking statins or uh, weight loss drugs, um, all of that, which is a weight loss drug can decrease vitamin D levels as well. And also, you know, you're better having vitamin D with fats, as we said, but if you're not absorbing fats well, or if you're having you're not secreting the right gastric juices or you know pancreatic secretions and bile acids and that's what you were touching on before that perhaps that that was affecting the absorption of your vitamin d when it came with fats that that can really impact it as well and the integrity of your intestinal wall so there's heaps of things that can affect vitamin d and that kind of leads back into testing as well that sometimes, and this goes with a lot of nutrients, you can be taking nutrients like B12 is a classic one, for example, that people think, look, I'm a meat eater. I'm eating tons of animal products. My B12 would be high, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're absorbing it mm. or that you're able to convert it. You know, maybe there's methylation issues and, and all of that type of thing. So yeah, taking in nutrients is one thing absorbing them is another. So that's another good reason why it's good to test to see whether you are actually absorbing your nutrients. Yes, that's right. It is interesting. I can remember speaking to my father and my stepmother and just some of the issues that my stepmother was talking about. I saying, you know, oh, just, just please test your vitamin D. Can't be deficient. You know, we have sunlight all year round. We go out for walks every day. Yes, but just test it (laughs) because it's not like, as you just said, it's not always the case. You might be doing all the things perfectly for perfect uh, vitamin D production, but there might be something off for you personally that's meaning that you're just not producing enough. So your levels are still low. So as you say, it comes back to, it really is just worth doing just one, you know, just one test to see where you're at. Yeah. Well, I can remember reading about vitamin D that it really was one of the most key, not vitamins, as we said, hormone in your system that affects absolutely everything. And I think you've, you've really highlighted that it was the perfect topic to start with. It really was to just show how essential it is and how easy it can be to overlook it. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it because, yeah, a lot of people will be, I'm sure, wondering uh, what their levels are like and if what they're, they're taking is um, is being absorbed and all of those those types of things, which is terrific. So we always end and you have given us lots of useful tips already but have you got a top tip that we can round off the show with my top tip i think would be as far as getting tests done because this seems to be a big area where people people are fobbed off very easily so my tip would be that if you're wanting to explore something with your health and have a test done to not just take no for an answer 
to try and try again and find someone who will do it for you or find an, an online lab where you can order tests yourself because it's the sort of test that sometimes you don't know how to interpret tests, which can be the problem with ordering your own tests. But I think with something like vitamin D, there's plenty of information online, mm, or you can easy. see a nutritionist or someone that can help you to interpret that test in relation to your health. And I think if you've got a lot of health issues, that's a good way to do it often to have a look at what that is in the context of what health conditions that you have at play, but not to take no for an answer and to, to feel okay about seeing other health professionals and finding the one that's going to support your health needs. If you're feeling like your health practitioner isn't listening or isn't on board with, with exploring what you feel is important, then go and, uh, and talk to others until you find the person who does support you. And finally, if somebody wants to work with you, can they or is it localised to where you are in Australia? And I know you have some free resources online as well. So perhaps we could just end with telling people where to find you, you know, especially if maybe they want to connect with you and work with you. Yeah, sure. So I um, have a clinical practice. I am based in Australia, but my clinical practice is all online. So I see women throughout the world. I have a lot of clients in America, in the UK, in New Zealand. So I can see people uh, pretty much anywhere. The beauty of, of Zoom and, uh, and telehealth nowadays. And so I have a, uh, a website which is called I Choose Health. And my motto is um, eat foods that love you back. So if you see that. Oh, I love <laughs> that. that. My... I can remember that was, <laughs> was one of my favorite. I'm not sure if you used it as a top tip. I think I might have put it into one anyway, because I love that. It's perfect. Yes, yes. I think that we had done that last time. But yeah, just meaning that, you know, health foods are not healthy for everyone. Mm. You need to find what your body loves. Yeah. And yes, so you can head to my website at um, ichoosehealth.com.au and go from there. Brilliant. Well, of course, the links will be in the show notes as well. So it'd be very easy for people to find you. Thank you so much, Megan. This was really interesting. I thought I knew almost everything there was to know about vitamin D, but I most certainly did not. So I found it interesting and I'm sure the people at home will too. Thank you again. It's been a great pleasure. Great. Thanks, Daisy. Thank you for sticking with me right to the very end. This is where, of course, we finish off the show with an end quote. But just before that, let me remind you that if you want to find out more about Megan, if you would like to work with her, or if you're looking for any of the links we mentioned about blood testing, you can find them all in the show notes at ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash 198. It's always very easy to find this week's show notes. You just go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash and then the number of this week's episode. So please do head over, find out a bit more about Megan and all the fantastic things that she does. As we've been talking about vitamin D, which is the sunshine vitamin, I thought it would be appropriate to find a quote about sunshine. So here we go. This week's end quote is from Morris West. If you spend your whole life waiting for the storm, you'll never enjoy the sunshine. Bye-bye, Keto lovelies. Bye.